Captain Midnight. This video is brought to you by Nord Pass. Also, this video features full spoilers. You know, heading into the third Ant-Man movie, I will admit that my expectations were pretty low. I was never a huge fan of the first two, and I actually remember taking a lot of heat for my review of the last one, because I think most MCU fans were a lot more into it than me. And then this one was getting some really tepid reviews. And when it ended, well, I definitely understood those reviews, but I would also say this movie is never as bad as Thor Love and Thunder or The Eternals. That said, that's a very, very low bar to clear. And when taken in the context of this film being like the big rollout for Phase 5, it's pretty underwhelming, at least for me, and there's just no way around that. There are bright spots along the way that I'll try to mention, but overall, I came away feeling like it's getting increasingly hard for me to care about where the MCU is going. Which is especially a problem since this film's main priority is setting up this new phase. I'll start with something positive. For the most part, the Ant-Man cast continues to be rock solid. Paul Rudd is one of those actors who can pull off the MCU comedic beats in his sleep, and he continues to shine here. I actually made a whole video about his career that I'll try to remember to put a link to here. I'm pretty proud of that one. Anyway, every time they lean on him for a quip or some improv, he pulls it off really well. Now, his character's emotional beats in this movie aren't all that interesting. Once again, they revolve around him wanting to be a good dad, which is fine, it works, even if Scott has never really had the depth that I think some other MCU heroes like Thor, Rocket, or even Star-Lord have had. Michelle Pfeiffer actually gets a ton to do, through a retcon that's pretty hard to swallow. But she's good, I especially like the scene where she discovers Kang's secret. I think her and Majors play that chilling moment really well. To the point where I wish we had more time in that flashback to set up their friendship as they try to escape the Quantum Realm. If they had just carved out some of that endless third act battle and given those two some more time as these trapped friends together, given that relationship a bit more room to breathe and time to develop, if they did that, I think that moment would have hit even harder. As it stands though, it's a good scene between two great actors, and at least for me, it's one of the high points of the film. Then there's the character of Scott's daughter, Cassie. We're now on the third person to play the character. This time she's Halt and Catch Fire's Catherine Newton. This is kind of a tangent, but I feel like the way they've handled Scott's family is kind of bizarre. Like the recasting in Endgame at least made sense because of the time jump, but here it's just really jarring. I won't hold that against Newton, who's totally fine here. Now there were some moments, especially when she was acting opposite MODOK, where it really seemed like her performance got lost in the green screen of it all, and it felt like she was in a completely different scene than the other actor. But I don't really want to pin that on her, especially after that video where Tessa Thompson pointed out that in Love and Thunder, some of her strange acting choices actually just came down to sloppy editing. Overall, I thought Newton fit into the cast well. Michael Douglas doesn't get a ton to do, but I thought it was pretty fun that he was the one who really got to put the ant in Ant-Man. The whole flying the ship by jamming his arms in goop joke felt like a PG-rated Rick and Morty gag, but that kind of goes for a lot of this movie. And I'm not gonna lie, him showing up at the end with an ant army like Gandalf at Helm's Deep was a pretty good time. Then there's Evangeline Lilly's Wasp. This many movies in, I feel like we should have a lot more insight into the actual relationship between Ant-Man and the Wasp. Rudd and Lily continue to have very little in the way of on-screen chemistry, and it's not helped by the fact that, though she gets a few big hero moments here, in terms of actual characterization, Hope gets so little to do. Her name is in the title, but the opening narration is solely from Scott's point of view, and to be honest, she kind of feels like an afterthought on the team, with her getting less comedic beats than just about everyone else. Honestly, I think Evangeline Lilly was fairly miscast from the very beginning, and it feels like they're barely bothering to write for her anymore. Speaking of from the beginning, if you liked most of the Ant-Man extended cast, you're pretty out of luck here. I know Michael Pena and his crew will be the ones people miss the most, and for good reason. He was always one of the biggest bright spots in these films. But I think the lack of Judy Greer as Scott's ex-Maggie and her husband is pretty notable. 
So much of Scott Lang's story here is about his relationship with his daughter. At the start of the movie, she's getting bailed out of jail. It just seems kind of strange that they're not fleshing out that storyline at all. I guess they mention Cassie's mom in a stray line or two, but it's like they functionally don't exist in this movie, which feels like a big missed opportunity given how important they were to the first one. And Lewis... I mean, what can you even say? The movie misses him from the very start. If you polled fans on what characters they most wanted to see in this movie, I'm pretty sure he would have beaten out the vast majority of the main cast. I'm sure Marvel has plans for him on Disney Plus or whatever, but his presence was sorely missed here. Instead, we got this sci-fi ragtag group of revolutionaries who kind of just feel like one-note gags at best and boring stock characters at worst. I mentioned the movie feeling like a PG, PG-13 rated Rick and Morty earlier. Well, this crew really leans into that. We don't really get much in the way of meaningful backstory here, and they really do feel like one-off cartoon characters that have almost nothing in common. Now, they do have some mildly funny moments, but I wish this script from Jeff Loveless, who penned some of the best Rick and Morty episodes, just had stronger material for them. Then there's the actual world of the film, the quantum realm. And talking about this, I think it's actually kind of tricky. See, I think if Marvel put out like a book of concept art for this film, you'd find a ton of great stuff in there. When taken individually, I like a lot of these designs. I especially liked Kang's foot soldiers who have a nice retro futurism, 70s Doctor Who on a big budget look to them. A lot of work clearly went into all of this. There's been articles coming out about how stressful this movie's post-production was and the long hours that the VFX team had to put in after a bunch of late changes were made to the story. I think there's moments where the visuals are pretty striking, and then there's just as many where they're like noticeably bad. I doubt I can show a clip of it here, but there's one moment early on before they go into the quantum realm where the wasp flips her suit on and it just looks terrible. But honestly, I don't even think moments like that are the biggest problem here. See, a lot of the movie was filmed using the volume, the pretty incredible VFX space famously used in The Mandalorian. Director Peyton Reed has admitted that they maybe didn't use the technology perfectly, saying there are limitations to the volume, and we push that system to its limit on this movie. What works so well in Mandalorian is they have a lot of lead time because they're doing a whole series to invest and to create these environments, and on the schedule we were on, it's not always right for that situation. I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on the volume, but to me, it just looked like they stretched the technology beyond what it could really handle here. The Quantum Realm never comes together as a place that feels lived in or coherent in any way. Actually, a lot of the time, it kind of just feels like an endless screensaver, with a lot of characters just kind of standing around in what feels like an endless void. Now, I'm sure some of that is intentional, but the drab color palette and the inconsistent visuals don't exactly do justice to the off-the-wall creativity of some of the comic art that inspired it. I will say though, I think Jonathan Majors Kang does manage to cut through all the noise and deliver a fun performance. I liked Majors in Loki, and this far deadlier character was maybe the high point of the film for me. Now the whole meeting of the Kangs post credit scene, I could have done without and I thought it looked pretty bad, but on the whole, I think Majors is doing some good work. I mean on the page, there's really not much to Kang here, honestly. His speeches are fairly cliche and predictable, but the actor is able to really bring some menace to every line reading that kind of carries it over the top. With a better script, I do really want to see what he can do with this character. Overall though, I really don't think this was the start that Phase 5 needed. It may be a little better than many of Marvel Studios' recent releases, but at least to me, it still feels pretty limp and lifeless. Like I said, I wasn't the biggest fan of those first two films, but I do think this one lacked some of the charm that those had. The MODOK stuff just didn't really land for me, aside from maybe his death scene. Even the Bill Murray role falls really flat. That felt like an attempt to recapture the fun of Jeff Goldblum and Ragnarok, but it doesn't come anywhere close. And really, trying to recapture past successes feels like one of the MCU's main problems at this point. I think the tone of these films needs to be rethought from the ground up. Now, I know Marvel Studios is still doing pretty well at the box office, but it feels like the tone of these films just has to be rethought from the ground up at some point. Because I don't know how much longer mediocre scripts, bland direction, and inconsistent visual effects can be papered over by charming actors doing funny line readings and decent improv. 
You know, it's not every day that a product makes both your online experience more secure and more convenient, but NordPass pulls it off. NordPass is the single best password manager out there. For one thing, it's just super convenient. You don't have to memorize a bunch of passwords or take the risk of having one password that you use for everything. Because NordPass both auto-generates complex passwords and stores and auto-fills them for you, meaning you get great, secure passwords without any headaches. NordPass is also a zero-knowledge password manager. Which means that you can see your passwords, but no one else, including the NordPass team, can. Plus, NordPass syncs up across up to six devices, so you don't have to worry about an annoying sign-in process when you get a new phone, laptop, or tablet. Like I said, it's the ultimate dual threat, making your online experience more secure and more convenient. So go to nordpass.com slash CaptainMidnightNordPass and get one month free by using code CaptainMidnightNordPass. Use that link in the description or pinned comment down below and make your online experience better in so many ways. Here's a special tip for the fellas and girls who have not already joined Captain Midnight's new 1940 flight patrol. You'd better hurry up and join at once because there's a big adventure ahead. The thing to do now is to get started. Because we're going to have not only barrels of fun, but loads of free gifts and prizes too.